Today we're joined by Dr. Elizabeth Benton from the University of Georgia, Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. Dr. Benton is a forest health outreach faculty located in Tifton, Georgia, and today she will discuss the biology, ecology, and management of the hemlock woolly delgid. This webinar is designed to help woodland owners, foresters, tree care professionals, Researchers, natural resource managers, and concerned citizens learn about the hemlock woolly adelgid and how we can use the knowledge we have to improve the health of our forests. The title of Dr. Benton's webinar is Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Biology and Management in the Southeastern U.S. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Benton. So Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Elizabeth, uh, can you press the talk button? Nobody can hear you. Oh, so start all over again. Yeah, let's go back and start over. Okay. So sorry. Everyone, Elizabeth Benton. And if you want to turn up your volume a little bit, that probably wouldn't hurt. All right. So I'll be discussing hemlock woolly adelgid biology and management in the southeast, but most of this will apply to areas in the northeast as well. Eastern hemlock has um, it's an iconic tree species in the eastern United States. It's got a wide range from Canada all the way south to northern Georgia and northern Alabama. And eastern hemlock occupies a very distinctive ecological niche in our forest. And for that reason, there has been so much effort into conservation of this tree. Hemlock is shade tolerant. So where other trees lower in the canopy may get shaded out, hemlock can survive in lower light conditions. And what that ends up causing is numerous layers of hemlock canopy within the forest canopy, which creates dense shade. That affects temperatures on the forest floor as well as in streams. That foliage low down provides lots of layers of habitat for wildlife. Over 400 different arthropod species are associated with eastern hemlock. As distinctive aquatic insect communities are associated with streams flowing through hemlock forest. Since hemlocks transpire when other trees have leaf off, hemlocks affect discharge rates in streams. The breakdown of hemlock needles affects soil pH. So hemlocks are a keystone species. And as such, its ecological role cannot be replaced. While other tree species you know, may have been lost, like American chestnut, we had other native species that could at least in part fill that role. But unfortunately, that is not the case with eastern hemlock. And now we have hemlock woolly adelgid threatening this forest resource. HWA is a native to Japan, so it's invasive in the United States. It was first detected in the eastern United States. Um, and let me say it's, it is an invasive in the eastern United States. So it was first detected in 1951 in the Richmond area, but was probably introduced a little bit before that. And then in the 1980s really began a rapid spread. This invasive species has two generations each year. So that's two chances for reproduction. And females lay over 50 or more eggs. So rapid population growth. And unfortunately, there are no native natural enemies that effectively suppress those populations. And as a result, we've had widespread hemlock mortality in our forest. And in the south specifically, we don't get the winter kill like areas more northward get. So our temperatures just don't get low enough to really put a dent in those conversations, in, uh, in those populations. So HWA is just a, a quicker type of an issue here where trees take less time to die because they don't get a break. Um, and so that's part of our particular issue that we have to face in the south. And then quickly looking at that life cycle, 
And this was developed for areas a little further north, so in the south, some of this might happen a bit earlier depending on temperature. But February to March, starting with eggs being laid and then going through a very quick spring generation, crawler, nymphs, and the adults. And then in June, eggs are laid again, crawlers come out, estivate during the summer when hemlock um, metabolic activity slows down, and then starts back up again in December. Um, November to December with fluffing out and being visually apparent. Here's a picture that I took in the lab last winter. These are two woolly masses where I've teased away the wool to show the eggs, so quite a lot in there. And then once the eggs hatch, we have a crawler and for a closer view. This is the only mobile phase for HWA. The rest of them stay in place, they're sessile. So this female will travel along the branch find a place that she wants to insert her mouth part, which is like a straw. So she'll sit in this one location and continue to feed fluids from the tree, feed on fluids with her straw-like mouth part for the rest of her life. And then continue to grow, produce wool, produce more eggs, reproduce, um, and we end up with graying foliage, canopy thinning, dead branches, and eventually a dead hemlock. When HWA feeds on a tree, it depletes the carbohydrate reserves, reduces photosynthetic activity in the tree, reduces growth, causes symptoms similar to water stress, and many other physiological changes that negatively affect the tree. There are nine species of hemlock worldwide, five in Asia and four in the eastern United States, or in the United States. The Western North American population is endemic. That means that they are from there. The hemlock trees in the West have been evolving with HWA and have some defenses. And predator complexes in the West have evolved with HWA so that they keep their population suppressed. Unfortunately, that is not the case in Eastern North America, where our trees are just more susceptible. And again, we don't have those predator complexes. Again, first observed in 1951 in Virginia. All of the counties, all of the areas that have brown or green color indicate hemlock range. And the brown indicates counties that are infested. So 2003 to 2012. So HWA has now hit the eastern edge of the hemlock range down to the southern range and is expanding northward and westward. So what is the real resource? When we talk about tree preservation or, or tree conservation, and the real resource may be different. Um, if you are an arborist and working in a landscape, then your resource is a bit different than in a forest. But I'll take a forest perspective because that's where many of us work. So it's not just conservation of a tree. It's conservation of a system, the entire hemlock system. So not only the tree, but the plants that are dependent on hemlocks for those distinctive plant communities, the soils that have the soils whose pH are affected, streams with the distinctive communities and um, and soil uh, water temperature. So it's a system perspective, and the goal of management in the forest should be for a healthy hemlock forest. And so all of our decisions have to be made with that framework in mind. What is the management goal? Because the tools that we employ will be very dependent upon what our goals are. Is it eradication? Is the goal to kill every hemlock in the hemlock woolly adelgid in the forest? Is it eradication of HWA in an isolated spot? In the south, that's not really a management goal. There are some areas further north where HWA gets knocked back every year, where it's just a slower process, where that actually is a goal of eradicating small spots. But in the South, especially, the goal is suppression. So to what degree? The lowest possible HWA abundance? HWA populations low enough to maintain hemlock crown health. So do we want functioning hemlock crowns that are reproducing, and is that our goal? Or is it HWA populations that are high enough to support predator complexes? So as our goal changes, that our management tactics might change them. There are numerous tools in the toolbox 
for HWA suppression. And since so many scientists and um, state and federal workers have contributed to our knowledge base, we have a lot of answers in hemlock systems that we wouldn't have in other systems. So first is horticultural oil. This is the oil that smothers the insects, blocks the breathing tubes so that the insects die. It's, a, it's more of a contact uh, method. It does not have any residual control, but it can be effective. However, there are some logistics issues. So you notice the picture on the right. Someone is using a high pressure hose and spraying way up into the canopy. So there are many instances when this is just not going to be feasible. But in an area close to roads and smaller trees, this is a valid management tactic, especially in landscapes, things like hedgerows and small hemlock trees and yards. But again, no residual control. So once it's sprayed, after a while, once it wears off or washes off, then another application will have to be applied for the next generation. Oh. And then biological control. And I include this picture um, because it shows a few woolly masses and about twice as many beetles as woolly masses. And unfortunately, this is not what we see in the field. There are numerous species that are either currently being used by management programs or in the experimental phases for biocontrol. And it's important to note that we're not just using one organism. There's no silver bullet approach. But the whole concept is to get a suite of organisms of biocontrol organisms that can together suppress HWA populations. And it's a very good and valid tool, but we just need to know when we should use it. So we have a picture of a, a broad landscape here. And a beetle relief site is on the bottom left-hand side. So let's say that we release beetles at this site, maybe 500 beetles a year. What they have to do is, number one, survive, not die out in the field. They will disperse in the landscape, hopefully find a mate and reproduce, and then control a pest species that can have a very high density. So that's a lot to expect, and this is not a quick solution. It's a slow population increase over time. We have to be realistic and know that it's not always effective. So it's not the best tool for specific trees. That goes back to your goal. If the goal is to save an individual hemlock tree, this is not the right tool. Or a hemlock, tr hemlock trees on a specific plot of land, this just isn't the appropriate tool. But if the goal is slow growth in the landscape, then this is the right tool. So this is best with experienced personnel as one of many tools being used on the landscape, with the personnel being very educated on the benefits and limitations of this method. This is our long-term management goal, a more sustainable management goal. But in the in, in the in between time, insecticides are necessary to protect hemlock resources. So again, the right tool for your goal. Single tree, this is not the right tool. Specific land area, not the right tool. But a landscape level with the goal of a slow population increase over time, then this is this is an appropriate tool to have in your toolbox. Doing nothing. And often this is the only management pro choice for some management programs or some plots of land. That may be due to finances, the ability to get personnel in the woods, and also um, the amount of hemlock resource. For instance, Great Smoky Mountains National Park has the largest HWA management program in the country. They have treated over 250,000 individual hemlock trees, which is huge. But they have a massive hemlock resource, and it just was not possible to treat every tree before it died. So areas had to be prioritized based on their value to conservation and public safety. So sometimes our answer is that we have to do nothing. But there are consequences of doing nothing. So look at this landscape of hemlock trees. They're skeletons, dead or nearly dead. And think about the use of hemlock, their function in the forest, and all the cascading environmental effects that will occur because hemlock is no longer there. And lastly, neonicotinoid insecticides, which is where we're going to camp out for the rest of the talk. 
Donatepteron and imidacloprid are used for HWA control. So let's think about insecticides. Let's frame this conversation. An insecticide is a chemical substance that is used to kill insects. So it, it has to be toxic. It, there has to be some kind of toxicity or hazard of this compound. If it's not toxic to insects, then it won't kill insects. So a hazard is something that has the potential to do harm. And again, if there's not some level of hazard, an insecticide won't work. But we have to look at this through a risk perspective, which is the hazard times the exposure. So how hazardous is the product? And what is our exposure level? For instance, bleach is hazardous. And if I were to drink two cups of bleach, that would be a large exposure. And I would have a very high risk of having negative physiological effects. But if I had a microliter of bleach dissolved in a gallon of water and had a few drinks of it, then my exposure is very low, and thus my risk is very low. And even something not very hazardous, like water, given enough exposure, can kill us. So again, we have to frame that conversation in risk. And our goal would be to get effective control while minimizing risk. A non-target impact is a negative effect on things that are not the intended target. And a trade-off is a situation in which you must choose between or balance two things that are opposite or cannot be had at the same time. Every management decision we make involves a trade-off, whether we're mindful of it or not. So here's an example for hemlock. Hemlock canopy, again, is home to over 400 arthropod species. And if you go take a beet sheet out in the woods and start beating on the foliage, all kinds of things will, will drop down. And they're there because that hemlock canopy is there. So if an insecticide that targets the fluid feeding adelgid is applied to the tree to kill the adelgid, it's not reasonable to have adelgid mortality, but not mortality of any other fluid feeding insects in the camp canopy. So that's a trade-off. There are two things that we cannot have at the same time. So we may have some potential risk to canopy arthropods, but if their habitat is gone, then they're not there anyway. So that's one of the easier trade-offs to think through. Here's a view of all the impacts that could possibly happen, or many of the impacts that could possibly happen in these systems. So imidacloprid is applied to the soil. And I'm using imidacloprid in this because that's where most of the research has occurred. It, there could be some potential impacts to soil arthropods where it's poured, and that's pretty reasonable. How far does it extend? It gets taken up by the hemlock tree with possible impacts to canopy arthropods. It may move through the soil and impact surface water quality, or be taken up by non-target plants with potential impacts to pollinators. And we can break these down just a little bit. So a couple of studies have been done on canopy arthropods, and one to two years after treatment, negative impacts were observed. However, three years after treatment, no impacts were observed. So the canopy was not different than the control tree. Nine years after, higher species richness in imidacloprid treated trees. And that's because the canopy was there and the arthropods still had a habitat. So that's a pretty reasonable trade-off. Soil impacts. So there is some vertical movement of imidacloprid down into the soil column. But there's very limited horizontal movement, so side to side in the soil column. And comparing trees that were treated and not treated, there was no difference observed in soil microarthropod populations. So you know, other than the area where we're immediately pouring that solution, it's not extending very far, and so there's limited impacts. And if we think about the arthropods that are right in the dirt where the application is being made, you know, that's, that's reasonable, but we have to compare that to the entire forest floor under that hemlock canopy. So it's a very small risk. And then water quality, and this is an area where I've worked in the past. So looking at Great Smoky Mountains National Park, again, that large management program, we looked at nine streams 
where metaclopid soil treatments had occurred. These trees had a minimum of a, of a 10 foot setback from the stream banks. And yes, the metaclopid is detected in streams in very low levels, below EPA safety benchmarks. But there was no observed negative impacts to aquatic insects. So while the hazard is present, the risk is low because the exposure is low. An additional study published in 2011 saw similar results as well. And then pollinators. And this is the piece of the puzzle that has not yet been fully assessed, although um, colleagues and I do have in grant proposals to explore this issue. One thing to take off the table is hemlocks are wind pollinated. So pollinators do not visit hemlock trees to get pollen from them. Another thing to bring in is that floral tissues do not usually accumulate high imidacloprid concentrations, like foliage will. So when imidacloprid is applied, it is moved in the tree through the vascular system. And that movement occurs because of the, tr the force from transpiration. So as leaves continue to transpire, that pesticide keeps getting brought up to that area. But floral tissues develop. And that's kind of it. So they're not having that continuous movement and holding of those chemicals like a leaf would. And when pollen and nectar has been tested, it did have lower concentrations in foliage. Since imidacloprid doesn't move very much laterally through the soil, we're talking about plants that have their root zone right in the area where the applications are being made. So it's a very limited area. And there are some reasonable tactics to reduce risk. So am I advocating pesticide use? Again, we're not thinking about a tree, but an entire system. So I would advocate responsible pesticide use. If the trade-offs are too great, then the choice to use pesticides is not a good one. If the trade-offs are reasonable, then we're talking about responsible use. So back again to the neonicotinoid insecticides, imidacloprid and dinotefuron. Neonics are a newer class of insecticide. The development began in the 1970s as a response to public concern about the vertebrate toxicity of insecticide classes that were currently on the market. So this class of insecticides was produced to be safer for vertebrates. That's fish, birds, and us. They were introduced to the market with the metacloprid being the first one in, in the early 90s and licensed in more than 100 countries with a $26 billion global market, the majority of which is from the Cloperd. And that's because the product's been on the market longer, and it's now off patent, which makes it more um, economical for many programs. Amidacloprid is the most widely used pesticide for HWA suppression. Again, this is systemic. So a solution is either poured on the trunk of the tree, injected into the tree, or applied to the soil, absorbed by the tree, translocated through the vascular system to the canopy. And it does persist in hemlock for many years, which is really the, helps us treat more trees. Um, that's a very good aspect of imidacloprid. And that's because once imidacloprid is applied, it is metabolized into numerous compounds, some of which is, are insecticidal. And of great importance is olefin, which is over 10 times more toxic than imidacloprid to insects and is more persistent. And olefin can be found um, in plant tissue and soil, tissue, soil sometimes, but is typically not found in water. So dinotepteron and imidacloprid, two different chemicals, two different tools. Um, dinotepteron moves in the canopy very quickly. So within two to three weeks after treatment, concentrations of dinotefuron are in the canopy in sufficient concentrations to kill HWA. Imidacloprid moves in the can to the canopy more slowly. So it takes about three months for effective concentrations to reach the canopy. And that's just because dinotefuron is more mobile than imidacloprid. Dinotefuron is effective for one to two years, so a shorter efficacy period, while imidacloprid is effective for five to seven or more years. And so I advise people to go and assess their resources after treating, you know, four or five years after treatment, see how they're looking. If the trees look good, if they're healthy, if there's little adelgid load, maybe give it another year and see how it looks. Um, if the tree is completely clean, 
the treatment is still effective, so it's probably not necessary to treat yet. So Dimetrexeron provides that quick, short-term reduction of HWA, while Imidacloprid provides a longer-term reduction, but takes longer to be effective. Dimetrexeron is best for heavy infestations, while Imidacloprid is best for light to moderate infestations. As the hemlock is affected by HWA feeding, the more adelgids, the more they're feeding, it begins to not function as well. And so it doesn't move fluid as efficiently. So if you have a choice of a compound that's very mobile in the fluid and will get up there fast, then that's your right product for this case. Um, a lot of people want to try to put more metacloprid on a tree that is in bad shape. It's not going to move it up there any faster. So dinotefuron is the right product for that situation. Dinotefuron is more expensive, while imidacloprid is less expensive. They can be applied together, either by applying both products at the same time, or applying dinotefuron first for quick population reduction, and then following with imidacloprid the next year for a longer term suppression. So if your management program has sites that are very remote and you don't have a ability to go out the next year, that might be a case to apply both products. Otherwise, um, one dinotefuron first and then imidacloprid. So that product choice and timing is dependent on resources and management goals. Imidacloprid can be applied by five different methods, soil drench, soil injection, trunk injection and bark spray, as well as cortex pellets, which are a slow release pellet. And this is really good in locations that are remote, where it's difficult to get water, difficult to carry in water, or during a time of drought whenever we don't recommend uh, liquid applications, but cortex can hang out in the soil and wait for the right condition, conditions and then begin to dissolve. Um, Dinotefuron can be applied by all of these methods except for cortex. So we have a tree we want to treat. First, we need to know how large it is. How much insecticide to use is dependent on the size of the tree. And I have a picture on the right side from the Tennessee Division of Forestry, who has this down to a science. And so they've marked a tree as 30 inches, and they've written exactly how many ounces of their solution to put on it for treatment at a later date. A bit about labeling and mixing instructions. Sometimes labels are not clear, and that can be very confusing. We can pull up three or four different imidacloprid labels and get three or four different recommendations. And that makes it very hard for the applicators. For example, a 1.6 ounce water soluble packet has 34 grams of active ingredient, so 34 grams of imidacloprid. And one of the product labels says that that can be applied to 12 to 48 inches of diameter. Well, that's a big difference. So if that amount is applied to a 12-inch tree, that's 28 grams of imidacloprid active ingredient for every one inch of DBH. And nobody uses a rate that high. If it's a 48-inch tree, then that's 0.7 grams active ingredient for every inch DBH. So quite a range that is listed on one of the product labels. For HWA, in general, 0.7 to 1.4 grams active ingredient for inch DBH is what is generally applied. Some labels recommend do doubling the dose for larger trees, so 0.7 grams active ingredient for smaller trees, and then somewhere between 15 and 25 inches DBH labels, some labels may encourage people to double that dose. We don't think that's necessary anymore from recent research, and I'll cover the optimized dose at the end of the presentation. So we have to mix this stuff up, and I'm using water-soluble packets as an example. So we start with a container, and we add an insecticide first. And water is added to get a final suspension volume. So we have our container with the water-soluble packet. And again, some water will be added to a final suspension volume. So we won't add 24 ounces and then add the packet to it, but we will get a final volume of 24 ounces. So if a 40 fluid, 48 fluid ounce solution, suspension is made, that concentration is 0.7 grams active ingredient for every fluid ounce. If 
for a 34 ounce suspension, it's one gram active ingredient for every fluid ounce. So it's a one to one. For 24, that's a 1.4 gram active ingredient for fluid ounce suspension. So the concentration of the suspension is going to determine how many ounces are used for treatment. So a 24 fluid ounce suspension is going to use half as much as a 48. Um, a warning on the 24 fluid ounce in colder areas, there's a problem with the product being suspended. We've tested out the 34 fluid ounce and it stays suspended even in the freezer after four hours um, with a little bit of agitation. So that's something to be mindful of when getting solutions that are a little more concentrated. To apply a soil drench, remove the dust layer. So that's the layer of organic matter right on the surface of the soil to expose the fine roots. Okay, because that's where we want to make our application, where the roots are actually going to be absorbing it. Pour the suspension around the base of the hemlock tree, checking the volume to be sure that the right amount is being applied. So pretty easy. There are a couple of different products that can be used for soil injections. Kirowitz is no longer sold, but many people still use them. One, two, read and director, and there are probably more. The thing to remember is these products will be pumped or clicked to release a small volume of suspension. For a Kirowitz, it takes six pumps for one ounce. For a one-two root injector, it's four pumps for one ounce. So making these applications, the, um, the applicator has to keep up with how much they're applying. So for a 10-ounce suspension, a Kirowitz would use 60 pumps, and a one-two root injector would use 40. There are different options for applying soil injections. Specified on some labels, a grid system, circle system, basal system. This is really up to the discretion of the applicator. And this is what a soil drench application is going to look like as far as the area that's treated. Um, if that circle is representative of the canopy line of the hemlock on the ground. Research was conducted by University of Tennessee comparing these methods and found that soil drench resulted in higher imidacloprid concentrations in the foliage, but both methods were effective to suppress HWA populations. So this is more of an applicator preference. And then basal bark spray. And these recommendations are from Richard Coles at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station to use a 110 dilution. So that's maybe one quart of flowable with nine quarts of water, using a backpack sprayer with a control flow valve, and calibrating these applications. Different dosage recommend different dosages could be used from 0.75 grams active ingredient per inch to 1.4 grams active ingredient per inch. So, using a standard 1.5 fluid ounce per inch dBH, the correct dose is applied according to how far up the trunk the treatment is sprayed. And so this is a good option where people may not want to use soil treatments, um, but can't be sprayed over water. Cortec pellets, which involves making holes in the soil. The label specifies two to three pellets for every inch dBH. And so pellets are placed in the holes two to five inches below the soil line and then covered up again. Oh, and it skipped the soil, the trunk injection slide. But trunk injections should be made by properly trained personnel. They um, are appropriate for areas that are right next to streams where soil applications and basal bark sprays may not be appropriate. But if a tree is in a yard, there's no water quality concerns, there's no reason not to use a less invasive and easier soil application or basal bark spray. So how successful are the treatments? This is data from work done with Great Smoky Mountains National Park and published in 2016. For this study, 102 hemlocks were sampled for two years. Ten branches were collected from each hemlock. Five years after treatment, 91% of the hemlocks did not have HWA on any of the branches. So 10 branches collected from the hemlocks were completely clean five years after a single treatment, which is remarkable. Going seven years after treatment, and these would be trees, these trees in this particular part of the study all received a low dose treatment of 0.7 grams active ingredient. 21% of the trees 
had no adulterants on our samples. So 79% did have HWA present. But how bad? What does it look like? So for that part of the study, seven years post-treatment, a total of 340 branch samples were collected. 86% of those had no adulterants at all. So 80% of branchlets having no adulterants seven years after a low-dose treatment. And only 6.8% had HWA in excess of 100 adulterants for a half meter branch. So populations were still extremely low seven years after treatment. So again, that goes back to treating your resource, checking your resource, and determining if it's time for treatment or not. And what about dosage? Because we want to use these insecticides as most efficiently as possible. And there's lots of different information on dosage. And um, you know, there's no perfect way to do it. If you're treating one or two trees in a yard, then this is probably a non-issue, um, as long as it stays within label rates. But if it's a management program, and they're having to treat hundreds and thousands of trees, they want to maximize their pesticide use by using it most efficiently. If there's high hemlock densities on an acre, then there's a limit to how much imidacloprid can be applied. And so sometimes when a land manager goes in to treat an acre, they have to walk away without treating all the hemlocks because they can't exceed the label rate per acre. So comparing a imidacloprid dose based on the diameter of the tree. So on the vertical axis, axis how much imidacloprid is applied to a hemlock in grams? And on the horizontal axis, how big is the hemlock by diameter and breast height? The traditional dose is what we see on labels a lot, which includes doubling the rate somewhere between 15 and 25 inches dBH. However, I have seen some labels recommend a high rate the whole time. So the dotted line that goes up to 25 represents 0.7 grams active ingredient for every inch dBH. Then it goes up at 25 inches dBH to a 1.4 grams active ingredient dose. So that's a big jump in the dosage that's being applied. But again, recent research conducted with Great Smoky Mountains National Park, as well as Richard Coles, shows looking at trees that were five years after treatment, that higher dose is no longer necessary. And we've developed a recommendation for an optimized dose, which is the solid line which results in much less pesticide use, especially for the larger trees. So measuring a tree, 14 inches dBH, going over to the horizontal axis, going up to where that line is, and then going to the left to the amount of imidacloprid applied in grams, so about 10 grams for a 14 inch tree. But nobody's going to use it this way in the field we need to put it in the applicator's hand in a way that's very easy for them to use. So we've recently published an outreach document for optimized dosage of imidacloprid, which includes some background information, optimized dosage for water-soluble packets, flowable product, cure wits, one two root injector, and Cortect. These include um, instructions on how to mix the product and how to apply it. And this document has also been posted to the opening page for this webinar. There are handouts to take for each application method. So all an applicator has to do is print out the handout, and they have everything they need to do this treatment out in the field. So we have inches diameter, as well as the number of fluid ounces. Those are indicated in the gray column. But remember, we have to mix the product correctly to get the right dose. And so for these recommendations, we've used a one gram active ingredient for every ounce dose. So the 34 grams water soluble packet is added to a container. Water is added to a final volume of 34 ounces. And that's a one gram active ingredient for every ounce dosage. So that 10 inch tree, that 14 inch tree, would get 10 fluid ounces. The Tennessee Division of Forestry has been implementing this in their program, and they've taken that graph and shrunk it down and put it on their DBH tape. So all they have to do is measure the tree, 
and they can look over at the 14 inches DBH and then to the gray column, 10 ounces of solution. So it's very easy to use in the field. And then for an additional comparison with Cortec, so the diameter and the labeled rate of two or three Cortec pellets for every inch DBH. So a five inch tree would get 10 to 15 Cortec pellets. A 20 inch tree would get 40 to 60 Cortec pellets. But using the new recommendation, that five inch tree only actually needs four to get the right amount of active ingredient with projected five year success. The 20 inch tree, instead of 40 to 60, would need 32 Cortec pellets. As a cautionary statement, do not apply more than 181 grams or 0.4 pounds of active ingredient per acre. This is the maximum rate listed on the label. So if you're using a one ounce, one, one gram active ingredient per one ounce solution, that would be 181 fluid ounces. So the limit that you're going to use is going to be dependent on the mixture that you've made of your product. Do not apply near water. And I get this question quite often, well, how close to water? Well, unfortunately, the label doesn't specify. So some management programs range from five feet from water all the way up to 40 feet from water. And when we think about a stream, we've got a bed and a bank. And there's water somewhere in that bed and bank area. It may be that today the water levels are low. And if we apply at the water's edge we could, and go out 10 feet, we could still be within the bed and bank of that stream, and the next day, our product could get washed away. So when approaching streams, consider the stream bed, which is the area between the bed and bank, and then go up the slope or away from that stream bank. I'm saying 10 feet, and that's because in our assessment with the Smokies National Park, they used a 10-foot setback, and we did not detect negative effects to aquatic insect communities that were associated with those areas. So we've tested that, and we see really low risk. Again, we're managing for healthy hemlock forests, so we have to manage that responsibly. Um, we have to make responsible decisions for that entire forest system. Please know your state-specific pesticide regulations. For most places, imidacloprid and dinotecturon are general use pesticides. But for many states, including, for instance, New York, it's a restricted use pesticide. So what products you can use and how you can use them depends on your state regulations. So please stay, check your state regulations to ensure that you're making legal applications. Many of y'all heard about the issue with the trees in Oregon in 2013 where dinotecuron was applied to trees blooming, linden trees that were blooming, that resulted in a massive bee kill and lots of public outcry for an application that was not legal. Those pesticide labels are there as a safety fence. They give us the boundaries where we can safely use those products to, to suppress our target organism while using that product safely for ourselves, for the environment, and for others around us. So sometimes safety fences are obvious, and sometimes they're very obvious. But for us to operate without that safety fence is a bad idea. So please follow your safety, your pesticide label. We all benefit from responsible pesticide use. And when responsible pesticide use is not done, when it's irresponsible use, it ends up hurting the rest of us who are, who are being responsible and legal and mindful in how we're using these products. And to all of those who are helping to preserve our hemlock forest, either through research as a state agency for community outreach. Thank you very much for your efforts in preserving this very important natural resource. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. And Great I'll job. Be glad to take uh, folks that have been putting in questions in that chat window, I have got them here. If you have others, feel free to get them in. But Elizabeth, let's jump right in here. One question we had was, does hemlock woolly adelgid prefer a certain age or size class of tree? They so will no. attack from the smallest ones to Alrighty. the largest ones. Great. No. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, right. So another one, have, have heavy snow loads or cold temperatures have any effect on HWA? And conversely, what about extremely warm temperatures? Yes. Extremely warm temperatures negatively affect HWA. So that's why we have that southern range. And um, 
So those hot summer temperatures can be problematic to them. And cold temperatures do affect them. Winter kill is very effective. For instance, in the winters of, I think, 2014 and 2015, when we had those polar vortex type things hit Tennessee, we saw a 95% decrease in our HWA populations. And so we had biocontrol sites that we were monitoring weekly. And we did see that immediate, very marked drop off. But unfortunately, those don't happen very often. And so population increased, starts to increase immediately. All right, next question. Uh, let's see, can you elaborate more on the realistic risk to pollinators in the system? Sure. So think about a basal drench being applied right at the base of a hemlock tree. So there's a certain area of that soil that will have a metacloprid. And if another plant has its roots right in that area, then it is susceptible to having a metacloprid taken up. If its roots are a foot away from that area, or if only a small portion of its roots are intertwined in that area, then the risk is much lower. So we're not talking about every flowering plant under the hemlock canopy, but just those that are in the immediate area of those applications. And then we're talking uptake into the plant and possible risk to pollinators. So it's definitely an area where we do need additional research, um, but the risk is not through the roof. We don't have the risk of pollinating insects visiting the hemlock trees, which is very important. Okay. Next question, given the very limited range of Carolina hemlock and its susceptibility, what is your opinion of our ability to preserve this species in the wild? There have been lots of efforts to preserve Carolina hemlock. And it's a limited range. It may have limited resources. But I think it's worth trying to preserve. Do you think it's possible? With insecticide treatments, it is. Okay. But I wouldn't recommend biocontrol for it just because we, there's not as much of a resource. It doesn't have as much cushion or wiggle room. Right, right. OK, next question. Uh, what is the relative efficacy of horticultural oil versus systemic applications of uh, imidacloprid or dinotefrin, especially regarding protecting individual trees in landscape situations? They can both be effective. They just have different benefits and limitations. So it depends, especially in a landscape situation. So we're not talking way out in the woods, but we're talking somewhere that's easy to visit. You know, at that point, it just depends on what the homeowner goals are, what the client goals are. So if they're willing to have an applicator come out and spray those trees twice a year, and they don't want to use an insecticide, then that's fine. Um, but if they're fine using a pesticide application, then there's less maintenance for it. But they will both work. Okay. How does hemlock woolly delge disperse over moderate to long distances? Do they disperse by their own means or on the bodies of other animals that visit trees like birds? They are passively dispersed. So animals, um, some, some wind dispersal, but mostly animals. OK, uh, a few more questions. Can you? Explain more about how concentrations of imidacloprid in streams adjacent to applications may be below EPA benchmarks, but did not have an effect on aquatic invertebrates. Uh, were these okay. aquatic life benchmarks or human health benchmarks? I guess they're looking for some clarification on you know, what your benchmarks are. The benchmarks. Yep. So those benchmarks are listed are aquatic insect benchmarks. So the EPA lists 1.05 parts per billion, or 1,050 parts per trillion, as the chronic benchmark for aquatic life. So chronic meaning a long-term constant or long-term exposure. So that's their benchmark. The benchmark for acute, which is a short-term high concentration exposure, is 34.5 parts per billion. The highest concentration I've detected in streams, and this would be after a rainfall event, 
was 800 parts per trillion. So it's still 200 parts per trillion below the chronic level. And again, that chronic level is a long-term exposure. And my highest concentration below that was during a short-term rainfall event. So those, that being below that is very, it's specific to aquatic insects. Since imidacloprid is a neonic and has low toxicity to vertebrates, the human health toxicity information is much, much higher. So it takes a lot more imidacloprid to cause a problem to human health. Okay. And how does tree size impact multi-year efficacy? As tree size increases, can we expect to see five to seven years of control on larger sizes with imidacloprid and two years with benotepherin? All right. So the study I did in the Smokies um, was the one study that did really looked into tree size with trees ranging from 12 to 30 inches diameter. Uh, most of the trees were, did receive that higher dose of imidacloprid, and we found that they had resulting higher concentrations of imidacloprid in the foliage numerous years after treatment. Um, populations were equally suppressed, and then at a site where all the trees were given a low dose, the trees still did have very good control, even in the larger trees. So we're still expecting good control, and we see now that those higher dose applications aren't really necessary. So I would expect good control. Um, numerous years, even in the larger trees. All right. Do you expect more HWA damage as more droughts uh, are likely in the future? Yes, droughts are bad for hemlock trees. It weakens them. And anything that weakens them can hasten their, um, their death. So the hemlock woolly adelgid population may not be quite as healthy as they would if the tree were doing better, but they're eventually going to drive it into the dirt and kill it anyway. So yes, drought is very bad for hemlocks. Should just note that drought is very bad for all trees. That's why we're having all sorts of bug problems across the southeast and across the this nation. Um, have hemlock woolly adelgid resistant populations of eastern hemlock been identified? Um, there has been work to look at resistant populations, and I don't know how much traction that's actually had. I mean, it's a it's a goal that we would all like to see happen to be able to keep this native species that's resistant, but it, it's not um, been as successful as we would like. Right. Do you know at what cold temperature mortality starts and escalates for HWA? I am not quite sure on how cold it is, but it's, um, we don't see it in Tennessee. It, generally, we had it with this polar vortex as we were getting down to the single digits. Right. Um, is there been any resistance to HW, or any HWA resistance to imidacloprid or dinotectorin? Not yet, so that is definitely a concern when you're only you're limited to basically using one pesticide or class of pesticides to combat a pest. Right. Yeah, the, is the Carolina hemlock a subspecies? No, it's a different species. Can trees safely be sprayed with hort oil near a river? And I guess this is going to get back to your your buffer area, right? So. Yeah, you need to set a buffer area, and it's, it's still technically a pesticide, so spraying something near a river needs to be taken in with, with caution, just like you would for any other pesticide treatment. Okay, and a, another question was very similar. Do you have any other comments on the use of horticultural oils uh, and water quality concerns? I mean, usually you're not going to be applying horticultural oil a lot in that kind of area anyway. but. I mean, it's something you could employ, but it's, you still have to use good judgment when applying a pesticide anytime. Right, right. And when is it too late to treat? Is it ever too late to treat? That is a great question. There have been cases, uh, you know, at some point, but there's not a rule of thumb. There have been trees that you're talking to the Smokies personnel who have been on this from day one. There would be trees that would look terrible that would do fine, and there were trees that looked terrible that, you know, made it. So it's it's really hard to tell. If you have the resources to throw at a tree, to try to treat it, then you should try to treat it. If you have to make choices between which trees to treat and they're all in bad shape, your smaller, younger trees are going to do better. They're more efficient at moving water, and they bounce back a bit better. And that's anecdotal, not from research, but from what people have seen from years in the field working with this. Okay. 
Um, you had mentioned earlier that 250,000 plus trees have been treated in the Great Smokies. Uh, that was a few years ago, and do you know if there's any plan to retreat these trees? Those trees have been on cycles of retreatment, so a lot of those have been treated numerous times. Okay. And, and initially, when these treatments started, it was still under patent and recommendations were for treating every two years. And I don't think we had as much knowledge about the longevity of it. So as we've learned more and research has increased, those time periods between treatments have expanded. Gotcha. And what is the optimal timing of the year for treatment, for imidacloprid and dinotefrin especially? Don't recommend treating when it's hot because that's when the hemlock slows down and not moving fluids as much. And so that product's not going to move up in the tree very well. Um, so your best time is to apply when it cools down. So gotcha. Fall. Uh, we're going to take just a couple more questions here, folks. Uh, are, all North, are all North American hemlock species equally susceptible to HWA uh, or at least to be killed by them? No. The species in the West, when they start looking at compounds that are produced by the tree that can make, um, that help with resistance, those compounds are made in trees in the West when HWA is active. And in the East, we don't have that. It may be that the trees in the East um, evolved with chewing predators like uh, chewing pests like um, hemlock looper, and it wasn't really evolving with with something like HWA. So the trees in the West have lots of mechanisms um, within their biochemistry that make them resistant or more resistant where the trees in the East just don't have okay. them. Okay. Are you aware of any and researchers then there's also or predator groups? complex. Oh. Sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. um, there's also the predator oh. complex. So where do you tease out the difference between those two things? But the West has that going for them where the East does not. Right, OK. Are you aware of any researchers or groups that are looking for HWA-resistant Eastern and or Carolina hemlocks? I know there has been some work done at NC State, I believe. Um, but I can, if somebody will send me an email with concern for that, I can look it up and get it to them. Yeah, I think Fred Hain at NC State, who's a former okay. forest entomologist there, has a group. I forget what it's called. Um, oh, but if it. anyone Kelly, is interested, if you, you Google. Right. Forest Restoration. Oh, there it is right there. Yep. Yeah, Kelly knows. There it is. Uh, last question, folks. Good question today. Uh, one more for you, Elizabeth. You mentioned tactics to reduce possible risk to pollinators. Would you like to talk about some of these reduced risk task tactics a little bit? Sure. Um, some state agencies, if a plant is blooming when they're treating, they'll go ahead and clip the blooms off. Um, if there's a plant that's blooming, and maybe it's taking up 25% of the area where you'd be pouring that drench around the tree, just skip that area and don't apply it where that plant is. Just apply it around the, the rest of it. Um, I had a resource manager um, contact me, and they were having to deal with a um, endangered plant species. And they had to have the hemlock for the endangered plant species, but they also had to have the pollinator. OK, so maybe they don't want to make a soil application, but a bark spray could work. And they could put a tarp under the tree while they apply the, tarp, the bark spray. So there's lots of little things that we can do um, that can help. Great. So one other thing we had, I think we're going to hold off on the questions because we have to get this uh, the CEU stuff done. But earlier, someone said the link to your the Benton okay. and Cowles uh, website or or publication was not working on the forestrywebinars.net page. What I'm going to do now, folks, is take that link and put it right there in the chat window. If anyone would like that uh, publication she talked about in her webinar here, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, with that, I will thank you, Elizabeth. Great webinar and great questions.